Well, hello everyone. I am Matt Williamson. I am still in Phoenix at the owners meetings. I'm recording this on Tuesday afternoon. You'll probably get it Wednesday. Um, not a huge number of topics dealer related the last couple of days. So I thought we'd do a little bit of draft prep. It's less than a month away. When, when in doubt, I'm going to take a, a grab a position and kind of give you an overview of what I think of the position as well as my top five as, you know, maybe even dig in deeper. Um, today we're going to do two that don't really influence the Steelers drastically, but I want to start with quarterbacks and go to running backs. So right now I look at this quarterback class and I like it better than I initially did. I'll be honest. When I was exposed to this class for the first time, I was like, Man, Will Levis has a lot of ups and downs. Richardson's the same way. These guys are hard to count on. Hendon Hooker from Tennessee had a really good year, but he's old and he's injured. Bryce Young is tiny. C.J. Stroud, unfairly by me probably, is an Ohio State quarterback. Have they ever had a good NFL quarterback come from Ohio State? The answer is no. Justin Fields might change that, but no. Their life has always been so easy, and that's kind of true with Bama, too. They're throwing to first-round pick after first-round pick, protected by first-round picks. But when it's all said and done, my top five are Stroud at one, Young at two, a little bit of a gap, Richardson at three, Levis at four and Hooker at five. And I was really tempted to even put Hooker over Levis. So let's start with Stroud. He's remarkably accurate and he really sees the game well. His highlight tape doesn't blow you away, but he runs the plays like they're designed to run. And that doesn't sound like much, but few do it. You know, everything's on time, goes through progressions extremely accurate, very catchable ball, good arm, good size. Yeah, he's throwing to unbelievably good receivers and he's protected well. And people knock him, you know, why doesn't he run more? Well, he didn't have to. He moves within the pocket really well, but moves his feet to use his arm. Now, when you play Georgia, a ridiculously good defense, he scrambled and made plays out of structure because he had to. He did not have the superior talent that day. And you watch his combine, and boy, the ball comes out of his hands really, really well. Smart. So I think he's a long-term starter that would blow me away if he doesn't work out. Now, a lot of people like Young more than Stroud. And Young really sees the field well. He's a natural playmaker. He also had a ton of talent around him. Yes. But... I can't, maybe I'm just an old school scout. I can't get over 5'10", 194 pounds. And he walked right past me at the combine. I thought, you're too little. And it's not because he can't see. You know, Russell Wilson, Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray. Some of those guys just have a hard time seeing the second and third levels because the trees are in their face. Young finds those lanes. He has great feet vision, understands route concepts, super smart. He's just so little that, you know, you look at Lamar, Tua, Kyler. Those guys aren't playing games in December anymore. They're all getting hurt late in the year. Durability, and that's a really hard thing to throw out there. I just couldn't draft Bryce Young at his size. And it might go a year or two without any problems. But he is going to get beat up. That's inevitable. His feet are going to slow down a little, and he's not even that great of a runner. I just think that keeping him on the field is really, really hard thing to bet on. Now, Richardson is hard to comment on because of all these guys, he's the one who I want to know his personality and things like that, that you and I just don't have that ability right now. I'm not going to sit down with Anthony Richardson. Unbelievably talented. Everyone in the world knows this. I mean, he is unbelievably big, strong, fast, physical, built in a lab in terms of all the height, weight, speed stuff. But boy, is he inaccurate at times. I mean, he misses guys by 15 yards. I mean, open receivers. And when I was a scout, I was taught no one ever gets more accurate at the NFL level, Matt. I mean, give me an example. And this was 20 years ago. And I there weren't any. Times have changed. You know, Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts. Dak Prescott, all those guys came in the league with massive accuracy concerns. And I think because they work with these side quarterback 
gurus, you know, Jordan Palmer, guys like that in their off time, in the off season, they break down their biomechanics and their footwork and their weight transfer and technology that didn't exist 20 years ago. You can get more accurate in the NFL level. Now, it takes extreme, extreme dedication that Hurts and Allen and Dak and these guys have shown. Uh, does Richard ha Richardson have that in him or not? In the meantime, he's going to be hard to play against, but he will get exposed if he can't co consistently complete the balls on third and eight that he has to. Levis scares me. I almost put Hooker over Levis. Bad decision maker, questionable accuracy, big, strong, fast, also looks like he was built in a lab. Um, had the least around him of all these, of course, you know, that he um, has to do more. You know, it, I don't always hold it against quarterbacks that, boy, he's making bad. It's kind of like Pickett in the first half of the season for the Steelers. Oh, he's trying, you know, they're losing by 20 and he's just trying to make a play. Is it really a bad decision when you know that chances are this isn't going to go your way and you have a high chance of throwing a pick and, you know, you try it anyways because you're desperate? Well, that happened to Levis a lot. Still, I don't think his accuracy is great. Um, I don't love that he transferred from Penn State. And his decision-making is very questionable. He did play through a lot of injuries last year. Now, Hooker, the knocks on him are he's old and he's injured. Well, if he goes to Minnesota, Seattle, the Lions, both those you know, teams have two first-round picks and just sits a year while he heals, I don't care that he's older. You know, Pickett was older. He's very mature. Um, he plays in kind of an odd offense, but he played a really good brand of football. Accuracy, tough, leader. I think Hooker will be a starting quarterback in the league, but just give him a year because he needs this injury to overcome. If he were cleaner, I would definitely have him four in terms of the injury. Um, and he's a little bit of a one-year wonder at Tennessee, but his last year there before his injury was outstanding. So that's my thumbnail on the quarterbacks. Uh, we're going to talk running backs when I get back. Uh, right for this. All right, running backs as a whole. Now, this, this part applies more to the Steelers. Ridiculously deep class. I, I think, you know, when we're talking fantasy, there's going to be 15 running backs that are going to be fantasy relevant all the way through the fifth, sixth round. So I think the Steelers, if they decide to go fifth round running back, there'll be somebody they like. It's a very, very deep class. I mean, and we know running backs fall anyway. You know, I mean, that's just the, the nature of the beast. So we can get really deep up into the draft of these. Maybe these are day three targets for the Steelers, but let's just get you acclimated to the class as a whole. Now, I hope most of you by now know who B. John Robinson is from Texas. Now, I have no idea where he's going to go. He might be the best player in this draft. I mean, to me, it's... Carter, Jalen Carter, the defensive tackle from Georgia, or Bijan Robinson is the best at what they do. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to be the first pick in the draft. He's going to go late because he's a running back. There's a surplus of them. We know all this. What's the value of running backs in the NFL? That's a much different story for a longer podcast. But Robinson's better than Saquon coming out. I mean, he's the best running back prospect I think I've ever seen since I've been doing this professionally, you know, in the last 20 years or so. If I have a knock on him, I have to squint really, really hard and say he doesn't run like Chris Johnson or Jamal Charles, but he still break away. I mean, he is a great receiver. He has unbelievable balance, vision, size. I think he'll be the best running back in the league a year from now. I mean, like it's it's he's that good, you know, I mean, so how the league values that, I don't know, but I have basically nothing bad to say about him. Uh, Jameer Gibbs from Alabama also is a high, high-level talent, an exceptional receiver. Led Alabama in receiving. Like in, in, in the college, they don't throw to backs like they do in the league. Gibbs is a phenomenal Austin Eckler-type receiver. Now, he's 5'9", slightly under 200 pounds. I don't think he's going to be a 20-carry-a-game guy. And I mentioned Eckler. I think Eckler's a little more physical between the tackles. But Eckler's a top-five back in this league. I mean, Gibbs is a weapon. 
split him out wide, great acceleration, unbelievable burst. He does have massive home run speed. He's going to be an impact guy no matter where he goes, but he might only touch the ball 15 times a game. So what's that worth to you? You know, I mean, that's interesting to me, but he'd, he would jumpstart any offense he goes to. Now, after those two, it's not as clear. I mean, I could give you 10 names that have top five consideration. You know, Zach Evans, Devin A-Chain, guys like that to me are outside my top five, but are really exciting as well. Um, my third guy is Zach Charbonnet, though, from UCLA. He's a bigger, more traditional six foot, 214. And my best way of describing him to you guys is – Young James Conner with more juice. Now, not tons more juice. Young James Conner was pretty good back. Better receiver than Conner. Breaks a ton of arm tackles. Can handle a big workload. Probably will be one of the best 32 backs the second he walks on you know, his new team. Probably going to be a number one, but not a great one. Um, he does have some home run potential as well as bell cow potential. And that's you know not a common combination as well as three down potential. So Zach Charbonnet from UCLA is just a really good prospect. Maybe he sneaks into the round two, maybe. Um, Tajay Spears from Tulane is a, a big hit with me as well. He's a C smaller, just he's 200 pounds. He's 5'10". Rare cutting ability though. I mean, he sees the field and his body moves in ways a lot of backs don't, you know, going through the B gap and just slices it back all the way across to the other B gap. I mean, uncanny slasher, you know I mean? It just changing directions, puts his foot in the ground and just leaves people in his dust, runs away from guys. Um, Devin A-Chain from Texas A&M is like that too. And A-Chain has sprinter speed, but he's small. He's 5'8 and a half, 188. Spears is a little more thickness to him, a lot more body armor on him than A-Chain. Those guys could be Round three, round four, someone might fall in love with A-Chain because he is a rare speedster, but I think he's a very niche back. Um, and then my last one I would talk about is B. John Robinson's backup, Roshan Johnson. This guy realized, hey, I'm behind the best back I'm ever going to see. And he would start for 95% of the colleges out there. He is a prototypical banger, big, physical Greatly respected because he took a back seat to a superstar. Hey, coach, can I play special teams? Can I run down on kickoffs? I mean, he's Benny Snell plus, 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 you know, and would the Steelers love him? Sure. But I think he goes in like the third or fourth round. I don't think I can use a third or fourth round pick on a running back in this draft up on Pittsburgh. He's a full grown man that's hard to get on the ground, understands, you know, what he brings to the table, how he helps a team, puts the team above himself. So I think Johnson from Texas should probably goes on to have a better college career than he does pro or, or other way around. I'm sorry, a better NFL career than he does college because he's just behind a superstar. You know, I mean, with all offense, no offense to Izzy at Pitt. Like if Johnson was there, he would have been their lead back or any basically any other college in, in the country or more or less. So uh, he's a guy to not sleep on just because he wasn't the best player at his position at his team. So once in a while, we're just going to do these pods, right? Just throw out a, a position or two, buzz through it and, and go from there. Uh, I'll be heading home here soon and um, we'll be talking down the line. All right. Oh, um, check out my uh, uh, article this week too. I, I did a little bit something different. You know, a lot of, of the off-season books, uh, uh, moves are in the books. And I'm liking the 17th spot for the Steelers in the first round less and less. So I wrote an article about who are the guys that might be there at 17 that you just run to the podium and you're thrilled they're there. And that list is thinner than you think. And then there's, well, what about this group? And that list is deeper than you think. So it implies to me that unless one of those dudes that run to the podium is there, I'm trying to trade down just to get somebody from the second list and pick up a third round pick or something along those lines. Now, you need, you need a partner to trade down and then maybe we'll talk about that tomorrow after you guys get a chance to read it. So that's where I'm at. Uh, over and out. <laughs>